This video is supported by The Great Courses Plus. In 1987, construction began on one of the most ambitious scientific experiments in the 20th century. It was called Biosphere 2, a completely self-sustained ecosystem designed to test technologies that we could use to colonize Mars. The idea was to have eight people live in this compound for two years, completely cut off from the outside world, growing their own food, recycling their own waste, and breathing oxygen from a rainforest that they maintain themselves. The project cost over $200 million in over four years to build. They brought in 3,800 different species of plants and animals to create a stable environment, including bringing in a specific species of hummingbird that could pollinate the flowers and not smash into the glass walls and kill itself. Four women and four men entered Biosphere 2 in September of 1991 to huge media attention. But only 12 days into the mission, one of the crew people cut her hand while processing rice and had to be taken outside of the compound to treat it, already breaking the rules. And when she returned, many people noticed that she was carrying a duffel bag with her filled with unknown items, which breaks even more rules. And only a few months after that, they started to notice carbon dioxide rising to dangerous levels. It turns out that when they provided soil for the plants, they wanted it to grow really well, so they provided very nutrient-rich soil. Well, the bacteria in that soil started releasing a whole bunch of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So they had to bring in CO2 scrubbers, which also broke the rules. And that still didn't quite fix the problem. By January 1993, the oxygen levels were so low it was comparable to a mountain climber at 17,000 feet. So they started bringing in compressed oxygen tanks. At this point, the whole concept of the thing was out the window. And after two years of living under constant surveillance, plagued by hunger and the stress of dealing with the same people day in and day out for years at a time, the eight Biospherians emerged from the compound, completely splintered into two groups, Lord of the Flies style. They refused to even talk to each other. The Biosphere Project went down in the history books as a total disaster. Despite hundreds of millions of dollars and years of planning by some of the brightest minds in the world, showing just how difficult it actually is to create a self-sustaining colony. So the question is, if we can't make that work here on Earth, how exactly are we going to make this work on Mars? I've talked in several videos about the different plans that NASA and SpaceX have about getting to Mars, and I'm generally very enthusiastic on the idea. But enthusiasm alone isn't enough to overcome some of the challenges involved. So here I'm talking about the top five reasons that going to Mars is a terrible idea. Issue number one, radiation. Let's face it, we're spoiled. The Earth is like a warm bosom, comforting us, protecting us, nurturing us. And that's all we know. So we like to think that the rest of the universe is the same way. It's not, the universe is a nightmare. Outside our protective magnetic spheres, space is a shooting gallery of cosmic rays and high energy particles and radiation that can wreak havoc on our body in ways that right now we can only speculate. There are only 24 people in human history that have left the protection of our magnetosphere during the Apollo program. And many of those astronauts reported seeing weird flashes while they were out there that were determined to be high energy cosmic rays, charged particles that were slamming against the back of their retinas. And also a study in 2016 found that there was a very high prevalence of heart disease, cardiovascular disease amongst these 24 people that was much higher than the general population, even though astronauts in general are more healthy than the general population. You kind of have to be to be an astronaut. In fact, astronauts who have flown in low Earth orbit have a lower prevalence of cardiovascular disease than the general population. And these guys were only exposed to this for two weeks. A trip to Mars would take 43 weeks, exposing the passengers to 2,500 times more radiation and cosmic rays. And that's just getting there. It would be double that to get back to Earth. And then there's the 18 months you would spend on Mars, which doesn't have a magnetosphere and a very thin atmosphere. Now, there are some solutions to that problem. One is to build a satellite that would produce a Tesla tube magnetic field at the L1 Lagrange point between Mars and the Sun. This would deflect the solar winds to not only protect the astronauts while they're on Mars, but also reduce the thinning of the Martian atmosphere. Similar electromagnetic shield could theoretically be built on the ships that are going to Mars, although you'd have to make sure that it wouldn't mess with the sensitive electronic equipment on board. And once on the planet, the habitats that people are living and working in could be radiation resistant, or they could live underground. But the fact remains, this is a huge unknown. Humans have never been exposed to this type of radiation for this long. It's a problem we've never dealt with before, and it's going to be a huge challenge to overcome. Issue number two, extremely low air pressure. The Martian atmosphere has only 1% the air pressure of Earth. You know, the air pressure we've evolved over billions of years to live in. This causes a host of problems alone. Obviously, we can't breathe on Mars. It's not just that there's not enough oxygen in the atmosphere, it's that there's not enough of anything in the atmosphere. Walking outside on Mars is not that different from walking outside on the moon from a life support systems perspective. And all of our habitats and modules would have to be completely airtight. The seals would have to work perfectly all the time, which is going to be very difficult on a planet that's covered with very fine dust. 
More on that in a minute. In looping back around to the radiation issue, the thin atmosphere does very little to scatter the cosmic rays. On Earth, the magnetosphere does most of the heavy lifting when it comes to deflecting radiation, but we also rely quite a bit on our thick atmosphere. So even if we could build an electromagnetic shield between Mars and the Sun, you would still have to deal with these cosmic rays that are bombarding the planet and not being scattered throughout the atmosphere like they are here on Earth. The thin atmosphere is also a nightmare for landing on Mars. The track record for landing on Mars is actually pretty bad because the the atmosphere is thick enough that you have to deal with the heat of re-entry, but it's not thick enough to slow you down. So where on Earth you can burn through the atmosphere and then deploy some parachutes and float gently down into the water, on Mars there's not enough air pressure for the parachutes to make that much of a difference. You wouldn't slow down to anything anywhere close to safe. That's why smaller rovers like Spirit and Opportunity use these bizarre airbag systems to bounce once they landed on the ground, and the Curiosity rover, which was much bigger, more the size of a car, used parachutes and a propulsive landing thing with a crane, this weird, bizarre contraption. It was amazing that it worked out at all. So SpaceX's vertical propulsive landing system is probably the best way to go, but it's still very new, and we're only gonna get a couple of tries before humans get on there. I will not be on that first ship. Number three, perchlorates in the soil. In the Biosphere 2 project, they grew their own food in the soil there in the biosphere and still they, they struggle to have enough food and when they emerged they were emaciated and malnourished. Growing your own food in greenhouses is challenging, even without the soil being poisonous. In 2008, the Mars Phoenix lander found significant quantities of perchlorates in the Martian soil. Perchlorates are salt compounds that are often used in rocket propellants and they're very toxic to human beings. They interrupt the thyroid gland and prevent the body from being able to absorb iodine, which leads to aplastic anemia. That's when your bone marrow can't produce enough red blood cells, and red blood cells are what carry oxygen throughout the body, so minor problem. Or if aplastic anemia isn't your thing, you might get a granulocytosis which keeps your body from producing white blood cells. You know, the stuff that keeps your body from dying from minor infections. So it's possible that prolonged exposure to perchlorates in the Martian soil could leave your body oxygen deprived and vulnerable to even the slightest infections. You'd be like the boy in the bubble. Literally, your habitat would be like a bubble. Except there would be other weak, anemic, highly infectious people in the bubble with you. The potential for a deadly outbreak that wipes out the whole colony is extremely high. It's like War of the Worlds in reverse, basically. Now this is a worst case scenario. The actual damage caused by long-term perchlorate exposure is still difficult to quantify because we just don't have that much of it here on Earth. Chris McKay at the Ames Research Center said that if this much perchlorate was in your backyard, it would be a super fun site. So basically Mars is a giant toxic waste dump. So if we were gonna grow our own food on Mars, which we will have to do, we would either have to haul in our own soil or figure out a way to get these perchlorates out of the soil, which might be very energy intensive and difficult. But even if we got it out of our food, some amount of exposure is inevitable. Martian dust is a fine powder, much like the regolith on the moon. And it was a real problem. After only a few days on the moon, this fine dust got all in the gears of the equipment and made the entire inside of the capsule look like they'd been mining coal. And the moon doesn't have any wind. Martian sandstorms are a real thing and they can be several thousand kilometers wide covering almost the entire planet. The dust will get everywhere and it will make the job of sealing up these airtight habits an ongoing hassle. They'll mess with sensitive electrical equipment, they'll grind down the gears and mechanical equipment. Just take one look at Curiosity's wheels now and you can see how much damage they can do. Often when it comes to space exploration, it's not the big problems that get you, it's the little annoying details that can bring an entire mission to a halt. And the Martian soil could be the biggest little annoying problem of them all. Number four, the gravity problem. Mars is smaller than Earth, with only 38% the gravity of Earth, which means that an average 150 pound guy on Earth would only weigh 57 pounds on Mars. Granted, this sounds awesome. The first Olympics on Mars are gonna be epic. But the effects of weakened gravity on the body over long periods of time are a big unknown right now. We do have some idea of what long-term zero gravity looks like, thanks to astronauts like Scott Kelly and Mikhail Korienko, who just finished a year-long space flight on the ISS. Although, the record was set in 1995 by Valery Polyakov, who was on the Mir space station for 437 days. And obviously, the effects are traumatic. Bone loss, atrophied muscles, cardiovascular issues. In fact, here's footage of Scott Kelly struggling to walk after he landed back on Earth. And this was with two hours of exercise on the space station every day. While the trip to Mars would be shorter than a year, it's not really by much. Even optimistic assumptions put it at around 200 days. That's seven months. Only 10 people in history have traveled in space for longer than that. So the first week or so on Mars are gonna be challenging to say the least because the entire crew is gonna have to be relearning how to walk after not using their muscles for seven months 
on top of the fact that they're learning how to function in one-third gravity for the first time in their lives. And then they're gonna spend 18 months on Mars with that one-third gravity. Will that be enough for it to maintain their bone density and their muscles? We don't know. But we do know that at the end of that 18 months, they're gonna spend another seven months in total weightlessness before landing back on Earth, at which point their loved ones will hug them and shatter every bone in their body. Okay, maybe that won't happen, but it's gonna be rough. Now, the human body is resilient, and this damage will probably be temporary, a lot more temporary than, say, the radiation exposure that they'll attain. Still, it's... It's gonna be rough. On the other hand, lighter gravity on Mars could help out in some ways, especially if you're constructing habitats and whatnot, being able to lift things with only one third of the gravity. Sounds pretty awesome. And you'll also save fuel on landings and launches. But last but not least, number five, the contamination problem. We've talked in a lot of videos about the Fermi paradox and the Drake equation and trying to determine whether or not there's intelligent life in the universe. We know some of the variables in the equation, the rate of star formation, the number of stars with planets. We have data to back that stuff up. But in the Drake's equation, F sub L, the one about life forming on these planets, we so far only know of one, and that's Earth. Which is why finding microbial life somewhere else in the solar system would be one of the most profound discoveries in human history. Because if life could form twice in one solar system, the potential for intelligent life to have formed somewhere out there in the universe goes up drastically. So one of the biggest problems about going to Mars is that we're not just bringing ourselves, we're also bringing our microbes. The second we land on Mars, we've contaminated it. In fact, some would argue that we've already contaminated it. There have been 14 probes that have landed on Mars, crashed some of them, but despite sanitation procedures that are borderline obsessive, it's impossible to know whether or not there were any microbes on those probes. But at the same time, we don't fully trust our machines and probes to verify microbial life on Mars either, so it's a catch-22. You can't verify the microbes are there without going there, but by going there, you invalidate the results the Mars uncertainty principle. I just made that up. Of course, if there were any microbes on Mars, it would probably be a species that we've never seen here on Earth, so we could validate them that way. And as we all know, nothing bad could come from a group of astronauts with weakened immune systems being exposed to a bacteria that no human body has ever encountered before. Do you want zombies? Because that's how you get zombies. So just to sum up, if you did choose to go to Mars, you would probably come back home nearly four years later, having been exposed to massive amounts of radiation and cosmic rays, your bones and muscles atrophied to the point that you could barely walk, your body starved of oxygen and ravaged by extremophile bacteria. Still think going to Mars is a great idea? Excuse me, I'm sorry. Can I just offer a counter argument? No, oh, it's... Counter argument, Joe. Well, yes, please. While it's true there are some challenges to face here, that's what we do. The human race is a species of explorers and pioneers that forge bravely into the unknown. It's in our DNA. What if our evolutionary ancestors had never climbed down from the trees? What if they'd never spread outside of Africa? Where would we be if we hadn't learned to navigate the seas and spread our descendants throughout all four corners of the globe? We're the only species that has the instinctive need to travel, expand, explore, regardless of the consequences. It's what makes us who we are. Going to Mars is just the next step in our journey as a species, and it's an important one. Yes, there will be some challenges, but I think it's worth it. Okay, I've just got one question. Would you be on that first ship to Mars? Oh, God, no. That's what I thought. What, are you insane? No. Ridiculous. You'd be, you'd be insane. You, death wish. So if you were on a ship to Mars for seven months, your muscles might atrophy, but your brain doesn't have to. That's because there's The Great Courses Plus. That's right, The Great Courses Plus has thousands of hours of high-quality lectures from some of the brightest minds from Ivy League schools all around the world. Topics ranging from astronomy to quantum physics. Um, you know, there's one for computer science, one for AI. Coding, I saw one for coding. There's one on nature photography from the people at National Geographic. Really? Yeah. It's like auditing a class from Neil deGrasse Tyson or Sean Carroll. There are no tests, learn at your own pace, and you can get access to their entire library totally for free for one month if you go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash answerswithjoe. But what if I want to take tests? Well, you'll just have to go somewhere else. Ah. Well, really, you gotta go somewhere oh, else. I need to finish the sorry. video. Okay. So anyway, thanks again to The Great Courses Plus for supporting this channel. And I wanna also give a big thanks to The Answer Files on Patreon who help keep the lights on around here. You might have noticed some new faces in The Answer File cubby here. Uh, really do appreciate your support. There's gonna be a lot more of those people joining. I wanna give a quick shout out to the people who just joined in the last week. We've got Marek Kristifiak, uh, Mercedes Case, Maddie Perrin, Michael Luce, and Simon Pyle, 
and Rudy Ruiz. Thank you guys so much for joining. If you would like to join them, get access to some cool behind the scenes stuff, including my secret vlog, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. What do you think? Do you have any possible solutions for these problems? Do you think the risks are overblown? Do you think the risks are worth it? Share in the comments below. Like and share if you liked it. And if this is your first time here and you like the cut of my jib, uh, I encourage you to subscribe because I come back with videos just like this every Monday. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys have an eye-opening week and I will see you here next Monday. Love you guys, take care.